So good morning, everybody. And we're excited to learn more about what all of you are doing across the state in California and what some of the needs for uh, research and regulation are. Um, so I just have a little overview to start with on microplastics. And we're all aware that microplastics are the dominant form by item of, of anthropogenic debris in the, in the ocean environment, and coastal environments. Um, and so there's trillions of pieces of microplastic that are circulating in these uh, aquatic environments. And every year, there are more microplastics being formed by the breakdown of macro debris that is entering the environment um, at the rate of 8 to 12 million tons of plastic every year. So it's obviously a concern. Um, some of the definitions that we have sort of settled upon for the sizes of microplastics go from about less than five millimeters down to micron size, so smaller than the width of a human hair. And there's various sources of microplastics. So those are primary microplastics that are formed as uh, manufactured microbeads or um, the, the pellets, the myrtle, the primary plastics that are used to form into uh, plastic products. And then we have secondary microplastics that are being formed all the time by the breakdown of larger items. So fragments of larger macro debris that get ground up at the surface through um, UV degradation and, and abrasion on beaches. Um, and also from things like um, laundering synthetic clothing that produces microfibers. Um, so these are forming all the time in the environment. And one of the concerns that we have about the size of these small particles is that they're accessible to a wide range of organisms. So they're internalized, they're ingested, um, they're, they end up in the gills of aquatic animals. Um, and so that's one of the concerns that we have about these very small particles. So if we look at, um, if we look at the microplastics in coastal environments and marine environments, we found um, about 24% of them are polypropylene, uh, about the same of low-density polyethylene. So those are the two kind of major categories. We also see um, PVC and high density polyethylene. And then there's a whole suite of other plastics of various varieties um, that are also found, but those are the dominant uh, categories. And so it's not just the polymers themselves that we have concern about. These polymers are associated with uh, additive chemicals that we use to enhance the properties of plastic to make them more flexible, like um, plasticizers and phthalates, um, antioxidants that are added, anti UV, anti static agents, flame retardants. So these are included um, you know, with, the, with the polymers themselves. And then as plastics are floating around in the marine environment, they have an affinity for um, persistent organic pollutants like PCBs and DDTs and flame retardants that absorb to the surface. And so then they're acting as little carriers um, of these absorbed chemicals. And so if they're internalized by organisms, then though they're also carrying with them the additives and the absorbed chemicals that may be transferred into the tissue. So we know there are trillions of plastic particles on the, in the surface waters, and they um, are concentrated near centers of population, um, in closed seas like the Mediterranean Sea, and in the oceanic gyres. Um, you can see the Great Pacific garbage patch is very well represented there. So there's, there's trillions of floating plastic particles, but that's not the only place that we find plastics and microplastics in the environment. First of all, not all manufactured Factored plastics are buoyant, so not everything is going to float. So PET, I think that plastic water bottles are made of, is, is less buoyant than seawater. Um, so that would tend to sink. But we also find microplastics in, in areas that are proximal to people, but also very remote from people. So in surface waters from coasts to the poles, uh, we find them on beaches, even on remote islands like Henderson Island and places that we've worked in the Cook Islands, uninhabited islands. Um, are strewn with plastics. But we're also now discovering that they're found in, in deep waters of the ocean, deep ocean sediments, even down into the Mariana Trench to 10,000 meters down. Um, so they're distributed throughout the water column. Um, and, and part of that is, you know, they become less buoyant through um, aggregation with um, algal ag aggregates. Um, they become biofouled and, and, and end up sinking and then probably uh, we, we think that sediments are a sink for microplastics. So just a little bit of information about California. So we have found microplastics all around the world, everywhere that we have looked for microplastics. We found them. We found them in every possible 
ocean environment. Um, this is a study of microplastics in National Park beach sands, and I've circled um, Channel Islands National Park is right next to our campus and, and near and dear to our hearts. But you can see everywhere that this study looked, uh, found microplastics in, in sediments, in, in beach sediments. Um, and, and just as we have found, the vast majority of those are synthetic fibers. Uh, so about 97% of microplastics are fibers, and the remainder are particles and fragments and films. This is work that we've done looking at 51 beaches in California, including the Channel Islands, which are not inhabited. Um, and that's a, a photograph there on the left of, of a beach, a very remote beach on one of the Channel Islands. And again, every place that we have looked for microplastics in beach sediments, we've found it. It's relatively lower on the Channel Islands than it is in other, um, in other areas around the state. Uh, it's relatively high around San Francisco and LA, as you might expect, expect near these centers of human population density. Um, but again, it's, it's ubiquitous in beach sediments. And one of the things that we're finding as we're looking on these beaches that have a lot of macro debris, there is no correlation between the, the high density of macro debris and high density of microplastics. So it's not predictive. You can't just look at a beach and say, well, there's a bunch of trash on that beach and it has relatively high microplastics. There seem to be different processes operating in how microplastics are accumulating um, on beaches. Um, in terms of surface waters, this is some data from uh, Cal Coffee and another study that um, have found microplastics distributed you know, at, at various dis distances from the coast. It's a highly variable distribution. But as we have found in other areas, and probably you have too, there seems to be really high concentrations in the very small size classes. So um, um, a higher abundance of items that are very, very small. Um, and again, you know, it tends to be a lot of fibers and fragments. Uh, some of these net toe studies are a little bit limited because they are only capturing um, particles that are larger than the mesh size, and the most common one used in plankton tubs is 330 microns. So this is a study that um, was focused on that kind of size class. We know that microplastics are increasing through time in the environment, which is to be expected as more and more um, plastics are added to uh, coastal waters. By two orders of magnitude between uh, 1972 to 1987 and 1990 to 2010, both in numerical and mass concentration. So you can see um, the accumulations of microplastics through time. Um, and so, I believe mass, yeah, numerical and mass concentration. And so why should we be concerned about microplastics? Well, plastics are associated with negative consequences, uh, disease, associated with disease on coral reefs. Um, we know that they are accumulating on the surfaces of uh, biotic communities. So they've been found on uh, uh, seagrass surfaces, so a potential vector for herbivores to be in ingesting uh, microplastics. And um, they, they uh, get uh, in, uh, incorporated into these algal aggregates. Um, and so that can affect the fate and transport of organisms um, and the plastics themselves. And we know that they're internalized by organisms. They are entering coastal food, rep, food webs by multiple feeding mechanisms. So we found them ingested by filter feeding Pacific mole crabs, which are found in the um, sandy nearshore environment. So about 35% of um, sand crabs uh, across 47 beaches in California had, had um, internalized microplastics. Uh, we've also found them in suspension feeding moon jellies. Um, many other people. Um, uh, Misty found them in um, token fishes and many other organisms. We, we found that they're being internalized. So we know that the multiple organisms are ingesting them. So it's very common. Hundreds of species have been found to consume microplastics. And their small size makes them indistinguishable from natural prey. Um, and so organisms that are filter feeding or suspension feeding are likely to ingest them. And so this is concerning to us because they're found in every possible environment from ocean trench amphipods 10,000 meters deep, tidewater gobies and coastal estuaries and endangered species in California, hundreds of species of seabird. And there's certainly <coughs> the indication that there's trophic transfer, so transfer between uh, different trophic levels across the food web. Various negative consequences. People are looking at 
uh, the effects of microplastic ingestion. So there's physical consequences from false satiation, changes in behavioral uh, feeding, blockage in the gut, perforation, tissue damage, also chemical toxicity of the polymers, but also the additive and adsorbent chemicals. And we're seeing indications, maybe some subtle indications, non-lethal effects on reproduction and growth in uh, invertebrate organisms. So most of the demonstrated effects have been at the individual mortality or, or sublethal level rather than sort of population-wide effects, but that's certainly something that, that we're interested in looking at. So we have a lot of ongoing concerns. They're, they're ubiquitous, as, as we've said, and, and increasing in density. We're seeing more evidence for microplastic toxicity, and it, it often boils down to, when you talk to people um, about human health effects seem to be a strong motivator for doing something about this. So seafood consumption is one mechanism that people are potentially ingesting microplastics. Um, if you're a dedicated seafood consumer, uh, particularly whole organisms like oysters and mussels, then you're likely ingesting uh, microplastic particles. But we don't really have a good handle on these trophic transfer and tissue transfer um, effects and, and toxicology. So just to wrap up, we are now in this phase where there's been a big explosion in publications of microplastics, a lot of uh, recent reviews that we've been doing um, with partners. Um, so there's been a really good effort to define the scope of the problem, and now we're kind of drilling down a little bit more on, on specific effects. Uh, and a big push right now that we're involved with is to standardize microplastics methods. And that's one of the things that we would like to work on in this workshop is sort of to within this kind of working group to be on the same page um, with sampling in different environmental matrices uh, and to gauge your interest in the various different uh, water, sediment, air sampling, uh, no, bio sampling. Um, so we're involved in interlab comparison studies and this workshop we're really interested to build a research coalition or monitoring effort um, with everyone in the room really to, to hear about what you're doing and maybe potential for future collaborations. Okay. So that's a brief introduction. Uh, I look forward to hearing individually from, from everybody about what everybody's working on.